All right, turn my mic on here. There we go. We're doing check one, two. You all can hear me okay? All right. Very good. I had to move that wire. I would absolutely trip on it, guaranteed. So we'll avoid that this morning. Well, it's, uh, it's good to be back here. It's good to be back here, especially um, in the aftermath of um, being in the hospital last week. Um, thankfully, it was only overnight. Um, had some, uh, some tests run uh, just to eliminate all the, the mean little nasty things it could have been. And uh, thankfully, it was just a virus that I'm in the process of, uh, of getting over here. So got my water. My throat's a little scratchy today, but other than that, we are in good shape. So appreciate you guys uh, having me out again. I think it was, I was talking to my wife. She disagrees with this, but I think it was last November that I was here. Um, I've been here since, but last November that I was here to speak. And um, it's good to be back. It's good to be back. It's good to see how many people are here today as well. Excellent to see a church that is alive and vibrant, paying attention to the supremacy of Christ Jesus. So let's just start real quick in prayer and ask the Lord to be the one that speaks to us today through his scriptures. Father, we want to uh, submit ourselves and yield to you today in what you have to say. And I pray, Father, that you would guard my tongue. Uh, guard my tongue from speaking my best philosophies and my best thoughts and help me to speak the words of God and to not hold back any part of your complete wisdom that you have to share for us this morning. Lord, I pray for everybody here, including myself, that our hearts would be open to change. Our hearts would be open to believing you in a new and fresh way. And that if there is anybody here that has yet to trust you as their Lord and Savior, that this would be the day of salvation for them. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together. Thank you for calling us together in your name. Thank you for making a way for us of salvation in Christ Jesus. And we ask for you to reign as our Lord and Savior today. In Jesus' name we pray. So as I was looking at this passage, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 2, as, you just, uh, as we just read. And as I was looking at this, one of the practices as you start to study the scriptures is always look at whatever you're studying in the context of the greater whole. So as I started thinking about this over the past month, I found myself reading over and over again the book of 1 Timothy. And I found a couple key themes that I want to talk about because these themes are going to show up in chapter 2, and it's important that we that we notice them. So if you haven't turned there already, turn to chapter uh, 1 Timothy. Turn to 1 Timothy with me. And I want you to notice first how much Paul draws attention to the supremacy of Christ in his message. Now here's one of the reasons why that's significant. If he was writing to an audience that maybe he wasn't very familiar with, or maybe it was a church where maybe he knew some people but not other people, it would make a lot of sense for him to keep going over this gospel message and the excellencies of Christ Jesus. But he wasn't. He was writing to a guy that was very well known to Paul. Timothy had spent lots of time with Paul, years in fact. They had been in ministry together. They had gone on missionary journeys together. Timothy had been his disciple, and Paul had, had in part raised him up in the faith. So he was very well known. He would have known the scriptures well. He would have known the message of the gospel. In fact, he was sent to Ephesus to help refute false doctrine. We're going to talk about that in a second. So clearly he knew these things well, yet Paul couldn't help himself. And I want you to notice this. Look in, for, in chapter 1 with me first. We're going to look at verse 15. He says this, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he goes on to talk about how he's the foremost and he's the example of God's perfect patience in those that are to believe. And then he says in verse 17, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So right away in chapter two, he doesn't even, he doesn't even get through the first few paragraphs before he has to start talking about the excellencies of Christ Jesus. So then he carries on with a thought. And then immediately he returns back to the same thing. He doesn't get four sentences later. He says, turn over to uh, chapter 2, verse 4. God our Savior, uh, verse 4, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there's one God and there's one mediator between God and man, men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. And then we carry on into chapter 3 and he goes on about some other things. And then at the end of chapter 3, he returns back to talking about Christ again. And he says this all the way over in chapter 3, verse 16. It says this about the mystery of godliness. It says, He was manifested in the flesh, talking of Jesus, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Paul can't let it go. 
He's got to keep coming back to this. This was so critically important, even for somebody that knew this well, to constantly have our attention drawn back to this. So as, as I was thinking about, you know, what do I title this message? Not that my title is, is worth anything other than, other than just trying to encapsulate a, a, a singular thought. Um, as I was thinking about it, the, the, the only title that I could come up with was this, that we need to be an undistracted church from the excellencies of Christ and his message. An undistracted church. So what we're going to look at this morning is how we go about being undistracted. Before we get there, though, I want to talk about one other thing that we see as a theme in 1 Timothy. Um, in 1 Timothy, um, Timothy has been left in Ephesus to set some things in order. Um, in fact, if we go all the way back, we won't turn there, but if we go all the way back to Acts chapter 20, you can read this yourself if you'd like. We see that Paul gathers together the elders of Ephesus. He actually does so. He doesn't have time to go to Ephesus, so he calls them down to Miletus, about 50 miles south of Ephesus, gathers them together. This is likely going to be the last time they're going to see each other, and he warns them that wolves are going to come in to try to steal away the flock of God. And then throughout 1 Timothy, and then on into 2 Timothy even, Paul continues to call Timothy to this purpose of dealing with false teachers and their unhealthy doctrine. False teachers in chapter 1 are identified as people who distract the church from the stewardship of faith and leads the church away from love. False doctrine in, in chapter 4 produces thanklessness and legalism. In chapter 6, false teachers are producing evil, dis, uh, I'm sorry, envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction. They're a snare that plunges people into ruin and destruction, and they cause people to swerve from the faith. There's a great threat to this singular focus of being undistracted from Christ and his message. And that's false, false doctrine. So we see in 1 Timothy these two forces vying for power and authority in the church. We have on one side Timothy who's told to pursue good doctrine, leading to health and an undistracted focus on the Savior. And we have false teachers promoting unhealthy doctrine, which looks to distract and make the church powerless in the world. And we see that in, verse, in, in chapter 3, in verse, um, he uh, gives a synopsis of everything he's talking about. If we go over real quick, I'll just show this to you. Verse 15, he says, if I delay, talking about trying to come and visit them, um, he's writing these things that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So how then does the church stand firm as a pillar and a buttress of the truth with healthy doctrine, undistracted from Christ, his salvation, and the knowledge of the truth? How does that happen? And that's what our message is going to be about today from chapter 2, that we are undistracted in three different ways. First of all, we're undistracted through prayer. Secondly, we're undistracted through modesty. And third, we're undistracted through order. So we're going to see these three different components show up in chapter 2. Prayer, modesty, and order. So let's start out in chapter 2, verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Just pause there for a second. So first and foremost, he's calling the church to pray, and he lists out four different ways to pray. He says supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings. I spent a bunch of time going down the rabbit hole of looking into each one of these words in the Greek and how is it used elsewhere and what's the context of the New Testament around each one of these things. Here's what I can tell you. It was a bit of a silly, uh, silly experiment. I don't think Paul is trying to list out this liturgy of prayer right here. I think what he's saying is this. Pray every way you know how for all people. Pray every way you know how for all people. And then he carries on in verse 2, in case we didn't believe the statement, pray for all people, he says, even pray for kings and all who are in high positions. So those people that, that feel outside your reach, that can affect your life, but you can have no influence over directly, don't forget to pray for them. And I can say, as I was reading this, that was the first point of conviction I came to within minutes of getting into the text um, many weeks ago, as I thought, oh my goodness, how much time have I spent complaining and talking to others about the current administration or decisions governments are making or our governor or this or that, all those kinds of things that, 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 that tempt us to be anxious and worried about the future compared to how little time I've actually prayed about it. But what we're being called here to do is to find our way to an unanxious life through prayer. And let me, let me show you where that is. So carry on in, ver in verse 2 with me. So we're to pray for kings and all who are in high positions, Here's the purpose statement, that we may lead 
a peaceful and a quiet life. Now, peaceful is a pretty easy word to understand. It means that you are at peace with external threats, external things that are coming at you. The word quiet is a little more challenging, and it's also repeated in this text later on when we get talking about women. So I want to define this word for us, because I think it's significant. When he talks about, have, about having a quiet life, he's not talking about a silent life. That would make zero sense in the context of what's being shared here. He's, he's telling Timothy to teach and promote sound doctrine, to pay attention to the teaching and proclamation of the scriptures. He's clearly not calling the church to be silent. What he's calling the church to be is unanxious. To have a quiet heart, a quiet life, is to have a life that is not bothered by the external threats that are coming at us because we're taking them to a sovereign God. So he's calling us to pray for the purpose of having a peaceful and a quiet life. And then there's, one, and then there's a follow-on statement. He says this in verse 3. This is good, so this peaceful and quiet life, not because we want to have a comfortable life, not because we want to be unbothered by the world around us, but this is good in verse 3, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires what? All people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So why are we supposed to have a peaceful and quiet life? It's not for, for, for our comforts. It's so that the message of Christ and his excellencies can go undistracted before the world. So people's ability to receive the truth depends in part on the peaceful life, the peaceful internal life of the believer in the church. If we're walking around filled with anxieties and cares of this world, we cannot demonstrate the excellencies of Christ and his lordship over our problems. You catch that? We cannot demonstrate the lordship of Christ if we're consumed with our own problems. So first and foremost, prayer is our path to an unanxious life. Secondly, Prayer is an appeal to the sovereignty of God. Notice again, I already pointed it out, first part of verse 2 there, that we're to pray for kings and all who are in high positions. People who can mess with their lives, but feel outside our reach. But here's the reality and the truth that the scriptures is laying on top of that. There is no person and there is no problem outside the reach of God's sovereignty. And therefore, the effectiveness of our prayers. There is nothing outside. I can easily put this, my hand up on this one, like I said, and say I have not spent nearly as much time praying for the things that I'm concerned about as I have complaining about them. But I want you to notice that, that even in going back to what he was saying about Christ just a minute earlier, back to chapter 1, verse 17, he introduces Christ early on in this book as the king of the ages. So the question that, that we should be asking ourselves in the face of this is this. Do we believe, really believe, that Christ is reigning. Do we believe that Christ is reigning? Psalm 110 is a passage that's come up a couple of times in the last few weeks for me. And I think it's great to illustrate this. Psalm 110 verses 1 and 2 says this. And it's, it's kind of a situation where David is uh, kind of overhearing this conversation between God and God. Okay, we, we kind of, as we get into the New Testament, we discover that the Father's having a son with the Spirit. Okay, and it says this. Yahweh says to my Lord... Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Where's Christ right now? Sitting at his right hand. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Yahweh sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. So we look around us and there's all sorts of enemies against Christ Jesus. But we must remember, he is still ruling. John chapter 19 incredible story. Christ is out. He's, he's on the way to the cross. He's standing before Pilate. Pilate makes this audacious claim. Jesus isn't answering his questions and giving him the respect he feels like he deserves. And he says this to Jesus, do you not know that I have the right to release you or to crucify you? Jesus's answer is incredible. He says, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. No authority. I was uh, reminded of this perspective um, just the last few days. Uh, we're connected, um, I'd say pretty deeply, to a work uh, of the ministry in Armenia. My daughter spent three months there earlier this year. Chris Pollock, some of you know him. Where's Chris? Back there. There he is. Hey, Chris. 
uh, his, uh, his son um, is uh, over there right now, spending six months there. And one of the primary works of the ministry over there is to prepare and send Armenian nationals into the surrounding countries to be missionaries. And over the past four or five years, we've been able to be a part of sending about 60 missionaries, short-term and long-term, into these surrounding countries. Um, so incredible work that's going on there. But one of these such people has gone into a Muslim nation... They were only there for about a week, and this happened about a week ago. They were taken by the police, and he and his wife were tortured in all sorts of ways. One of the ways being they they were cutting them with razor blades, and they were pouring salt on the wounds. And he writes this immediately after getting released. He says, this is a quote from what he says. He says, I am in great pain, but I will never give up. I will be in the path of the Lord. In spite of all this in this country, my God's kingdom reigns. And I will still serve in that country. I will not give up because of what they have done to me and my wife. That's living out the lordship of Jesus Christ. That just happened a week ago. This kind of stuff is happening around the world. And we have faithful believers that are living in the light of Christ's reign. So first of all, we are undistracted through prayer. Let me just give you a couple of takeaways real quick from this section. We talk about spheres of influence. You know, things that are inside our control and things that are outside our control. But here's the deal. The believer's sphere of influence extends to every person because Christ's kingship extends over every person. And that includes anybody in the highest position in our government or any government in the world. Secondly, the world needs Christ's followers faithfully dealing with our anxieties and struggles on our knees so they can see Christ in his message with clarity. We must be a people that pray. We must be a people that pray. So first of all, the church needs to be undistracted through prayer. Secondly, we're going to go on to the next section here. We're going to skip to verse 8. And I'll warn you, there's there's going to be a variety of skipping around here because, um, you know, this could have been six to eight hours in this one chapter as opposed to 45 minutes. So there's a lot here, but we're going to, so we're going to skip around a little bit, but I'm going to try to hit the highlights so that there's enough there that you can go back and continue your own study if you're interested in something. So, first of all, we must be undistracted through prayer. Secondly, we need to be undistracted through modesty. Now, I chose the word modesty uh, uh, for for a reason in that section. It's going to show up in verse uh, verse 9, talking about women. It doesn't show up in verse 8. But modesty is one that I think illustrates well what we're being called to as a church. And it illustrates it this way. So, modesty in verse 9 is talking about women um, and how they're dressing And that same word only shows up one other place in the scriptures, and it's in Hebrews. Let me read you that passage. Listen for what you think might be translated from the same word for modesty. It says this in Hebrews 12. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Anybody hear the word modesty in there? It's not in there, right? There's no word for modesty. The word for modesty is translated in that passage, awe. And here's the idea of modesty. Modesty is not just the act of covering up nakedness or putting a paper bag over a pretty girl or anything like that. Modesty is the act of taking things that could be distracting and removing them so that the thing that needs our attention can have all of it. And that's what the church is being called to. We need to be able to come and gather together in awe of Christ Jesus not distracted by the behaviors and the dress and all those things of each other, but undistracted so we can see him in his message. So let's take a look at that. It's going to start with the men in verse 8. He says this, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. So the first thing that stuck out to me is this, men, we have to be told twice to pray. He just went through this, right? He just got done telling the church to pray. First thing he tells guys, guys, pray. We have to be told twice. Because as soon as we walk away from the teaching on prayer, what do we do? We immediately pick up the tools and the weapons and the things that we use to enact our will instead of turning to the Lord as our sufficiency. We have to be told twice. So pay attention to that. First thing he says is that we should pray lifting holy hands. I think this is a great picture. The idea of holiness in the scriptures is when something is set apart for some, for some purpose. So to lift holy hands is to say, set apart your hands to look to the Lord in prayer. In other words, put down your tools, put down your weapons, put down the things that you feel like you need to accomplish your will and turn to God. Give him your full 
attention looking to God to be your sufficiency. And I can say I am, I am constantly convicted by this verse because Dan needs to stop thinking that my abilities are on equal footing with God's sufficiency. I'll have a problem come across my desk at work and immediately I start typing away and I, I trick myself into thinking I'll work on that problem while I'm praying as opposed to saying, no, put the keyboard down, ask the Lord to deal with these things. The Lord is so much more capable of dealing with our issues than we are. In fact, it says this in Colossians 1. It says that Christ is before all things, and in him all things hold together. My marriage is totally held together by Christ Jesus. My family is totally held together by Christ Jesus. This church is totally held together by Christ Jesus. The molecules of our body, the creation around us, every piece of it, the things that we think we can do are so tiny compared to what Christ is doing for us. We have to see that reality and live in that as men. And and then he gives us the antithesis of this, the opposite of this. He says, without anger or quarreling, and it just reinforces the point that in our flesh, Our our immodest power is to accomplish things through the strength or the violence of our emotion and our intellect. Our emotion being our anger, our intellect being quarreling. And when he talks about false teachers, if we were to look over to, just turn there real quick, we're in the same book, 1 Timothy chapter 6, one of the ways we identify a false teacher is this. It says in verse 4, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy, and quarrels about words. How do we identify the false teacher? This is the kind of power they're employing. How do we identify men that are faithful and godly? They're employing the power of the Spirit through prayer. We have to turn to prayer, men. That's the way that we demonstrate modesty in the, in the church. Our primary strength must be in prayer to the Lord. Now, the second aspect of modesty that he gets into is talking about women. Let's go on in verse 9. Likewise also... That women, so we're back in chapter 2, by the way, likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. So he starts out that verse by saying, likewise, in a similar manner to how men need to be laying down their earthly power and how they accomplish their will, women need to do the same thing. The power is different. The power for women that it calls out here specifically is your beauty. Now, he's not saying don't adorn yourself. He's not saying don't pursue beauty. He's actually saying the opposite. He says you should adorn yourself. 1 Peter 3 is a similar uh, com- uh, passage that goes over almost identical material. It just puts it in the context of the marriage instead of the church. And it says that, we should, that, that women should pursue beauty, but it's a different kind of beauty. It's a different kind of adornment. It's, a, it's an adornment that demonstrates the God in you coming out through good works that you've, that you've done believing in faith in the Lord versus the kind of beauty that draws attention to you. And here's the reality. That beauty that draws attention to you is going to fade. That's the reality of the world we're in. But the kind of beauty that the Lord is calling us to is imperishable, it says in 1 Peter 3. So every woman, no matter how old or young they are, can be absolutely and totally beautiful in God's sight if they're pursuing the right kind of beauty. And young women, let me give you the, uh, 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 a little spoiler here. The kind of man you want to marry is going to be attracted to that. So pay close attention to your attitude, to your demeanor. It talks about a gentle and quiet spirit in 1 Peter. And right here, pay attention to go do good works in faith for Christ Jesus. So women, likewise in a similar manner, be modest in the way that you dress and, uh, and be modest in, um, and men be modest in the way that you deal with your emotion and your intellect. So in summary, men need to turn, God's, turn uh, to God's power and lay down the violence of emotion and intellect that you could wield, and women display your faith through good works, laying down your earthly power to attract attention to yourself. So an undistracted church, first and foremost through prayer, secondly through modesty. Now we're going to get into talking about order. Let me just pause here for a second and put a quick parenthesis into this text. I I think as we read this earlier, you probably noticed, and as we get into it, you're probably going to feel a bit of this. 
in the culture that we have and in the day and age that we live, I doubt there's anybody here that doesn't feel at least a twinge of discomfort when we read this text. But what I want to encourage you to do is this. Have a yes theology. What I mean by that is this. When you approach the scriptures, have the starting point of saying, God, I may not understand why it's good, but I'm going to believe that it is good. And I'm going to ask you how it's good. But start from the starting point of accepting the words of God as true and receive them like a child. Don't immediately go to trying to explain away the words of God, to fit them into a culture, to fit them into the spirit of this age, which is absolutely against Christ Jesus. Try to accept them for what they are, okay? So that's the short parentheses I want to put in there. So let's look at this idea of order starting in verse 11. Get a quick drink here. Verse 11 It says, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. Now, the first part I want you to see there is that for a church to have good order, the first and foremost thing that we need to be doing is let a woman learn. In that Greek, that statement is very clear. What it's saying is they need to be invited to the table as a student of Christ alongside the men. This isn't just about women submitting to men and that kind of a thing. The first and foremost thing we should notice is that they have a place at the table. Women are equal heirs with Christ Jesus. We're told that in 1 Peter 3 again. And they are equal disciples in the instruction of the scriptures. So there's, there's equal footing, just like we're all gathered here today. Now, that's not true all over the world. That's not true in Muslim societies. It wasn't true in Jewish societies of that day and age. And what Paul is making sure they understand is that in Christ Jesus, men and women should be able to learn together, undistracted, untroubled. Remember that definition for the word quiet? that they can learn in quietness, unanxiously learning, undistracted from the clamor of men. Go back to what he told us to do, men. We're, just, we're supposed to be laying down our anger and our quarreling. Those things are massively distracting and make the, the meeting and the discussion of the word difficult when we turn to those kinds of powers, especially to women. And I've been a part of that. In fact, I've failed in that area where I've turned to, where I've turned to arguments and whatnot when we've had uh, the, the church gathered together, and it has been unedifying for the entire congregation. We should be gathered in teaching in a way that's edifying for every person here to be able to enjoy. So first of all, let a woman learn in quietness. Again, an unanxious heart. And then it says, with all submissiveness. So secondly here, I want to just kill an idea, okay? I want to kill this idea that submission is a bad word. We're, we're handed that by our culture, absolutely. But in the scriptures, that, is, that couldn't be farther from the truth. In fact, there's only one time in the scriptures where the idea of submission is, uh, is, is negative. And that's when, in Galatians, when people were trying to enslave the people of God under the law again. And Paul says, we didn't submit to them for a moment so that the message of the gospel would be preserved. That's the only time submission was looked at as a thing that shouldn't be done. The rest of the scriptures, and I would say it might be, it's definitely, it's definitely one of the most prominent themes, but it might be the most prominent theme throughout the entirety of the New Testament, is this idea that every man, woman, and child is demonstrating submission to God through submission to some earthly relationship. Children are told to submit to their parents. Men are told to, uh, and women are told to submit to the government. Women are told to submit to their husbands. We're told to submit to our bosses at work, our masters. There's always an aspect of submission that should be played out in every one of our lives. And if we miss any, any of those categories, we're supposed to submit one to another. So there's always an aspect of submission. And when we do that, when we submit under the authorities that God has put in our lives, we are demonstrating faith in trusting the God that is over the person that we're submitting to. I, my, my wife has a command to submit to me, and I understand that that is a difficult command because I'm a very imperfect person. But when she does that, when she submits to my authority as her husband, she is saying, yep, you might make bad decisions. You might be disobedient to the Lord at times, but the God that's above you is going to deal with you, and I'm going to trust in him. That's what is being said when we submit in these authorities that God's given us to submit to. So let's not be afraid of that word for a minute. But it does beg a question. What exactly is a woman submitting to? Is it every woman is submitting to every man in the church? Well, that that would make no sense in this context. Nowhere do we find that in scriptures. What they are submitting to is is explained a little more in the next verse. Let's look at verse uh, verse 12. He says this, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. 
So teach or exercise authority. Let's, let's unpack that a little bit. I'm going to make a few statements here that I'm not going to have time this morning to fully defend and unpack, but let me lay out a couple ideas that you can go look at yourself or catch me later, and I'm happy to share, share more about this. The only form of personal authority that belongs in the church is the ability to persuade. That's the authority that gets wielded in the church. And I'll explain this a little more. In other words, authority is carried through teaching. We see this demonstrated in the qualification for elders. I don't know if you're going to get to this next week or the week after, but in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, it goes through the qualifications for elders or overseers. Titus does the same thing. The book of Titus chapter 1 goes through the qualifications of elders and overseers. In both those passages, there's only one qualification that gives any indication as to what those people are supposed to be doing, what their function is, and that is the ability to teach. Everything else is describing the quality of their life and, and, and how their families are in order and how they're not given to wine and they're not given to, to, to the pursuit of money and all these kinds of things. But the one thing given to us that has to do with their function is they have to be able to teach. In fact, it goes on a little bit further in Titus that it says that they have to be able to promote sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. So the, the, the authority that leaders in the church wield is the ability to explain the scriptures and to demonstrate how God calls us to whatever's being talked about. That's the, that's the degree of authority that an elder or, or, or an overseer has. And we see that similarly, uh, I'll just point you in the direction, we won't read it today, but we see that similarly in Hebrews chapter 13. We're told to obey our leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over our souls. That word obey literally means be persuaded by. So how do we submit to our leaders? We have ourselves open to persuasion, open for them showing us in the scriptures how something is true, and then uh, hopefully being convinced and in unity with them about that. So teaching is an expression of authority. And elders' means of authority is this capacity to convince the people in the congregation of the truth of the scriptures. God is not looking for the church to be lots of little kingdoms with powerful men. He's looking for a unified kingdom under his kingship with faithful under-shepherds pointing to his rule. That's what he's looking for. So what are women being called to submit to? They're being called to submit to the godly, faithful teaching of the scriptures. That's what they're being called to submit to. And let me just make this one point. This ordered responsibility in the church is just as relevant now as it was in this letter. Now there's, there's a lot of um, opposing views to this idea. Um, the, the most prominent of which is called egalitarianism, which says there's zero distinction between men and women in the church. The problem I have with that, there's, there's several things in this text that point us to this, but the most significant of, of, of this is, uh, is what he follows these statements up with. He's going to point to the creation story. He's going to talk about how Adam was formed first, then Eve, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what I want you to notice is this. This can't just be a problem that happened to be going on in the church of Ephesus, and Paul is just addressing that with Timothy contextually in that one church. It can't just be something that was in that one era of time, that maybe people will try to make the argument that, well, in that culture, in that society, women had a different role, and he's, he's addressing those things. We progressed past that in our current society. That doesn't make any sense because Paul's entire argument is founded on the creation order of how God takes us back to Adam and Eve, or we're taken back to Adam and Eve, and how God created them, and then how the fall transpired. So we have to look at this as something that is just as applicable today as it was then. So let's read that in verse 13. And 14. He says this, For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So let's just pause there for a second. We'll deal with verse 15 in a moment. So Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was and became a transgressor. What's Paul getting at with that? We have to go back to Genesis chapters 2 and 3. Now, just for the sake of time, I want to tell this story back to you to, to kind of move through it quickly. But I encourage you, if you have any questions, go back there and see for yourself how these things transpired. So the first thing that Paul points out is the creation order. Adam was formed first, then Eve. Why is that significant? Well, if we go back to Genesis chapter 2, let me just tell you the, the quick survey of Genesis 1 through 3. Genesis 1 
is the creation story. Genesis 2 zooms in on the creation of man. Genesis 3 is about the fall of man. Okay, so that's the way it transpires in Genesis. One is the creation. Two is talking about the creation of man specifically. Three is the fall. So if we zoom into chapter two for a minute, we see this. Man was created out of the dust of the earth and God gives man a command. Okay, the command was this. Eat whatever you want in the garden, but don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now what's significant about the order is Adam was, was created, but Eve had not been created yet. Okay, so Adam's created, Eve's not there, God gives the command. So God entrusts his words and the obedience to those words to Adam, not to Eve. Okay, and this is why it's, why it's important to understand this. Eve got deceived because she was the only one of those two people that could be deceived. Okay, she didn't receive the words firsthand. So she had the words of Adam, secondhand receiving of God's words, and she had the words of the serpent to compare to each other. And when you have these two things, and one doesn't seem like a greater authority, well, she gets tempted by what she sees. She liked the fruit. She wanted to eat of it. And she goes and sins through that temptation. But Adam was the one that was entrusted with God's instructions. And then if we skip over to chapter 3, we see God looking for Adam and Eve after the fall. They're hiding in the bushes somewhere. Who does God call out to? Adam. He calls out to the man and says, where are you? So Adam was entrusted with God's words. He fails to follow God's words and to live inside the the role and responsibility that he was given. And then God holds him responsible for that. Now, the other thing I want to to notice is that in chapter 3 of Genesis, Adam was there for the entire temptation of Eve, but he was silent. At the end of that passage, it says that, that, that Eve took the fruit and she ate of it and she gave it to her husband who was there with her, it says. Okay, so, so Adam was given the words of God. He stood there and watched his wife be deceived by the serpent. And then he partook willfully and knowingly rebelling against the, the, the commands that God had given him. And then he's held responsible for that. So the order of creation is critically important that we understand that God gives and entrusts certain things to men. And when we fail to do those things, men are held responsible for that. Okay, so that's the, that's the order of creation. So let me, let me give a bit of a synopsis here. Paul is calling our attention back to the order and the intent of creation into the perfect roles that men and women were created in. Keep in mind that, that order and that marriage between Adam and Eve was there before the fall. That order was there inside the creation that God called very good. Okay, so there are distinct roles that men and women occupy, and that's part of the very good creation that God created. Now, if we were to go back to chapter, chapter 1, let's just go back there real quick. I hate retelling a story without showing you where it is. Chapter 1 of Genesis. Let's go all the way back there real quick. God gives, we have a, we have a term for this. It's called the creation mandate. And he says, he says this. He gives them a command. This, this is a command that applies to all mankind of all time. And it says this, verse 28 of chapter 1. He says, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and birds of the heavens and every living thing that moves on the earth. So God gives mankind two commands, be fruitful and multiply. You were just made as image bearers of God, now go cover the earth with with the image of God. Be fruitful and multiply. The second command is have dominion over every living thing. Be fruitful, multiply, have dominion. Now, if we skip over to chapter 3, notice the things that the curse that comes upon them focuses on. Uh, Chapter 3, verse 16. God says to the woman, I will surely multiply your your pain in childbearing, and pain you shall bring forth children, and your desire will be for your husband, or to master your husband, is the word there, and he shall rule over you. So the first thing that we see that a woman has to deal with in the face of sin is that the very thing that she was told to help Adam with, which is be fruitful and multiply, is now going to be done in pain and suffering. Okay, then we go over to the man. He says this, and because you listened to the voice, this is verse 17, because you listened to the voice of your wife, and what that means is not just hearing his wife, it's being persuaded by her to step away from the path of God and follow after her. Because you listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it, 
uh, commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the gr- cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For ye are dust, and to dust you shall return. So here's the curse to the man. That idea of having dominion over every living thing, that just got a lot harder. So women, you're going to have pain and suffering in rearing children. Men, you're going to have pain and suffering in the exercising of dominion. Now that's not to say that men are the only ones that are going to experience pain and suffering in having dominion. It's not to say the only ones that are going to experience pain in rearing children is going to be women. But they certainly have primary responsibilities here. And the curse that comes upon them focuses and zeroes in on this. So, we see that God gives them this task, be fruitful and multiply, to have dominion. We see Eve created with a primary responsibility to help Adam accomplish the impossible task he's given to multiply. I mean, he goes through all the animals and names them, and there isn't a helper found for him. That's what it says in chapter 2. So God gives him a command that he cannot fulfill without the woman. By the, by the way, I'll just let me put a quick parenthesis here. I think it's worth saying. Men, we were given a helper to accomplish something. That does not mean a servant. In the New Testament, so no, notice some parallels here. In the Old Testament, we're, we're told to, to be fruitful and multiply, and that, that, that's going to be an act of, of spreading the image of God over the entire earth, right? In the New Testament, we're told to be image bearers of Christ. And we're given a similar task to be fruitful and multiply. He says it differently. He says, go make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey. There's the idea of dominion. All the things that I've commanded you. And he says, I'm going to give you a helper to get that done. Both things are impossible tasks. Both things require a helper. And here's what I've noticed. Men that treat their wives as insignificant parts of that equation often treat the Holy Spirit as insignificant parts of that, of that other command. I want you to pay attention to that because these things are images of each other. They should illustrate each other to us. If you want to live a life with a powerful helper of the Holy Spirit in you, you probably should also live your wife, understanding your wife well. That's 1 Peter chapter 3 again. Look at verse 7, man, if you need some reinforcement on that point. Chapter 3, verse 7 of 1 Peter. So, I've totally lost myself in my notes. Let's see here. So anyway, so we talked about the curse. We talked about how it gets at the heart of the two different roles and responsibilities that are in creation. And here's what I think Paul is saying. Look down at verse 15. We're going to deal with what might be the hardest passage. Sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's get back there first. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Look down at verse 15. This might be the most controversial passage in here. It says this. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. What is Paul talking about? Saved through childbearing. Let me just submit to you a simple answer. Paul is calling both men and women, men he's going to call them throughout the book of 1 Timothy, and specifically here women, back to submission to their creator. And he's focusing here on, on women here. That's what he's calling them back to, submission to their creator. He's calling women to be faithful in the task that he's given us in, cre- in creation. And this, this, uh, this idea that, that we should avoid family, avoid children, um, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of lies, I would say, that are, that are given to men and women today regarding, regarding kids. Actually, let me just pause there and give you a few of them that I've heard. Don't marry. Don't have children. Have as few as possible so your life will be more comfortable. You won't be fulfilled as a mother. Find fulfillment in masculine pursuits. Find, uh, uh, make no distinction between male and female. All of these lies are not new lies to us. In fact, in 1 Timothy, there's two doctrines called out that are called the teachings of demons. And one of those is abstinence from marriage. Paul was dealing with the same problem and the same temptations that we face today. This isn't this new thing in our culture, right? Women are being drawn away from being mothers Men are being drawn away from being leaders. That's what, that's what the devil wants to do. And, uh, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. You know, the devil doesn't want more image bearers of God in this world, especially ones that are raised to bear the image of Christ. But here's, let me just put some, the truth of the scriptures over this. Genesis 1 tells us to be fruitful and multiply. Psalm 127 tells us that children are a blessing. It says, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord The fruit of the womb, a reward, like arrows in the hands of a warrior, are the children of one's youth. 
a high calling on a woman's life. If the Lord provides you a husband and opens your womb, both miracles that you have no control over, is to be a godly mother. And this is, this is called out very specifically even for Timothy. It's in T- 2 Timothy, it's called out twice. Paul points to the basis of Timothy's faith being what he was handed by his mother and his grandmother. And then it calls it out again later in chapter 3 of, first, of 2 Timothy, that Timothy's beliefs are rooted back and the trustworthiness of his beliefs are rooted back to how they acquainted him with the scriptures. Women, you have such a vital role in the household of God to raise godly children. Such a vital role, and it's a role that men cannot occupy within God's order. Now, we obviously participate in when that. Men are told to instruct our children um, as well. That's clear in Ephesians. So it's not that we're doing these things completely siloed into buckets where men are over here and women are over here. But women, you have a primary responsibility to be raising children and to see that as the highest pursuit in your life. The career, not the highest pursuit. You know, finding other means of fulfillment, not the highest pursuits. This is what we are called to um, as men and women in the church. So here's what I think Paul's getting at here. He's not rewriting the path of salvation for women. He's not saying, you know, well, for men, it's, it's going to be grace by faith, you know, grace through faith. But for women, go have babies. That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is this, that when we say, God, I'm going to listen to you even in the face of opposing doctrine and believe that no ounce of my suffering will be wasted, that sounds a lot like faith. That's the path of salvation for all of us. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 that this light and momentary affliction that we face in this world is working for us in eternal weight of glory. So take this back to Genesis for a second. Adam and Eve are told to be fruitful and multiply. They're then told that that fruitful and multiply process is going to be filled with suffering. But there's a promise associated that by following after that, there's going to be one who comes that's going to crush the head of that serpent. Okay, and then, and then Adam acts in faith. This is after he sinned and after, and, and after God confronts him. Adam acts in faith by naming his wife Eve the mother of all living. What is he saying in that? All right, God, I'm going to get back in order with you. So the act of men leading and doing what they ought to be doing in the church is an act of faith and it brings salvation. We see that in 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'll show you that in a second because it's a corollary statement to this one. And we see in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, that the act of faith when a woman says, I'm going to let the Lord decide for me what is right and good and pursue the pursuits with him, expecting him to make that fulfilling, that's an act of faith. It's no different than the path of salvation. We're told to make Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 10, chapter, Romans 10, uh, uh, verse uh, 9, I believe, says that we are to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. Those aren't just things we say. We have to believe that God actually is Lord and King. And if he's Lord and King, it means he gets to decide what's good. And we get to say yes to him. That's what we get, that's what we get to say. So again, not a new path of salvation, but an example of how we need to submit ourselves in faith to King Jesus. Let me just show you how men are also called to something similar. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. A similar statement is made on men. He says this, Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now again, Is Paul rewriting the path of salvation for Timothy? Is he saying, well, everybody else is by grace through faith, but for you, you have to teach? No, he's saying, go live in the role and responsibility that you've been given by God. Handle well the word of God. Exercise that authority. Women, exercise this authority by going and bearing children and raising them to be godly, a godly generation inside the Lord's design. So let me give you a quick summary here and then we're going to close. I have one minute left. So here we go. (laughs) Summary is this. Men, there are snakes in the garden. There are false teachers that want to destroy the effectiveness of the church and the safe havens of our homes. Guard the truth and learn to promote good doctrine that produces health and salvation to the hearer. Women, allow men to step into this responsibility. Don't fight and clamor for it. Don't neglect the vastly important role of rearing image bearers of God and train them to become image bearers of Christ. It says this about women in Proverbs 31. 
Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. That's what we're being called to here. So if we occupy these roles in harmony, we share in the responsibility to pray, believing God's sovereignty. We live in modesty, not distracting each other from Christ. And we live ordered under the lordship of Christ Jesus with distinct roles, giving each other the space to fill out our individual responsibilities. We will have an undistracted church, drawing full attention to the excellencies of Christ Jesus, his salvation, and the knowledge of the truth. Amen? Amen. Mike, would you close this in prayer? Heavenly Father, as we are just overwhelmed.